Hey everybody, welcome back to our weekly podcast. My name is Patrick Tan, General Counsel for Chain Argos. Uh, with me as usual every week, our CEO and Chief Data Scientist, John Ryder. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, thanks for uh, dropping all your comments, likes, and subscribes. We appreciate that. And uh, what are we going to talk about this week? Um, we've got a couple of topics for you. We're going to talk about South Korea's uh, rules with respect to crypto assets, but uh, specifically on stable coins, uh, which seems to be a hot topic. Um, and I, I, I was just going through some of the uh, proposed changes. To, well, not really changes to the law. It's it's more like ap- uh, application of the existing law to to uh, um, stable coins, and also not just applying existing law to stable coins, but sort of enhancing it to cater for the unique idiosyncrasies of um, this new sort of uh, form of value transfer. And that, um, given that we just released. Uh, the URIGHT research report about about a week ago at this stage, I think. Um, if you haven't seen that yet, please go check out our Twitter, hand, uh, Twitter handle, our X, as, as it's called right now. Ha- have a look at the X handle where we tweet about URIGHT, um, which is Banking Circle's uh, Euroback stablecoin. And there are strong parallels with that as well. Um, I'll get to that in a short while. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the Crypto.com lawsuit. A lot of people have pointed out that this is this looks the same as the uh, the consensus lawsuit against SEC in Texas. But there's one slight important difference, and uh, John will give us the lowdown on that. And finally, we talk about 21 BTC, um, which is a, kind of a wrap BTC Thing I'm about so John John's got the all the dish on that um um he'll 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 keep us posted but let's just jump uh, switch gears and jump straight back to the South Korea stuff um John tell us a little bit about the, the South Korean rules okay so some virtual <coughs> asset service provider sort of regulatory regime went live I think in July yeah and subsequent to that a lot of exchanges have or service providers have closed um I'm not sure if it's because they didn't think they could get licenses didn't want or whatever but they they closed, so they didn't get licenses. Um, and then a number of them have temporarily shut. In fact, there's a quote in one of the Korean newspapers that uh, was it 30 billion won remain tied up with three virtual asset exchanges that have temporarily suspended operations. That's Google translated from the Korean, but um, and people can't get their assets out. It's not clear if temporarily suspended is in the you know traditional sense or in the crypto sense where they're temporarily suspended forever. But uh, I guess we'll see what happens. Uh, it's about a thousand to one, so 30 billion is about 30 million. Uh, yeah, the amounts that are trapped haven't been gigantic, but they're you know these are people's money and oh, yeah, service yeah, fire closed. Yeah, um, and there's been a lot of local Korean reporting uh, on both sides of the political spectrum. So it's important here. We'll have some quotes from some Korean media again, Google translated, um, and f- sort of in an American context, it's important to know that these quotes come somewhat, pretty much equally from uh, what in American terms is left and right leaning. So the two major political sides in Korea, the newspapers associated with both sides seem to have roughly the same issues and quotes and government official type attitudes. So there's a consensus within the group of people who make the rules that this has to change. Um, so there's, a, there's one quote about the, the customs service saying that over a billion dollars of sort of illegal arbitrage and money laundering have happened, which is maybe not hugely surprising. Some of these reports can go back quite a ways. Um, so I'm going to read. So, okay. So a little bit about how foreign currency works in Korea, and then we'll read some of these quotes. So Korea has a restricted currency, and in general, companies need to report all foreign exchange transactions to the part of the government that reports this, which is the Strategy and Finance, I think. Yeah, that's so, right. So strategy and Finance. Minis- uh, Ministry of Strategy and Finance. Okay, but I'm not sure if that's a, a, translation, a translation thing. Yeah, it's yeah. some finance ministry related yeah. thing they have to report to. And this means that companies are required to pay each other in local currency and convert. Yeah. And you can say that that's inefficient. Companies can have foreign accounts. So if you're an exporter and you have occasional uh, foreign expenses, you can you know do a little bit back and forth. But there are strict reporting requirements on that. And those are you know legal requirements. You can argue it's inefficient whatever Korea has foreign exchange controls because of issues in 1998. You can Google Korea 1998 to find out about that one. Um, I mean, the currency fell 90%. Companies went bankrupt and there was a lot of trouble. So they have issues, which they're you know, entitled to have that opinion. Um, so there's reporting in Korea's largest business newspaper. Um, so you can't have a corporate crypto account generically in Korea. So I'm just going to read a quote here. Although corporate accounts are not permitted in Korea, it is true that small-scale traders and individual business owners are actually more advantageous in terms of cost and procedure to trade stablecoins under their own names. This person also added, since foreign currency sales are subject to the small business rate, there may be cases where sales are not reported. Uh, And then a separate 
bit. Um, a government official said it is estimated that 10% of domestic trade transactions are conducted in stable coins. So what these people are saying, and these are government officials speaking to the major business newspaper in the country, that companies are paying each other using offshore currency in a way that isn't reported, particularly for tax and other reasons, um, and is sort of exempt from the oversights that are required. Uh, then I'll read another quote from that article. There are also some who point out the advantages of stablecoin transactions in trade are highlighted as the Domestic Foreign Exchange Transactions Act strictly controls foreign exchange transactions. For example, under the Foreign Exchange Transactions Act, offset processing must be reported to the Minister of Strategy and Finance. Offset processing is an accounting method that offsets amounts incurred from each transaction where there are two more. So the thing that they're doing needs to be reported explicitly due to longstanding rules and isn't being reported. Right. And further, this is being done in people's personal accounts on behalf of their businesses. So in a country with foreign exchange controls and I guess any kind of taxation, but you know, GST, VAT type stuff, this is going to be an issue. And when government officials are talking about it in the country's leading business newspaper, um, that's not going to go really well. A lot of these places that have closed are probably not going to reopen. Uh, we're not arguing in favor of these rules. We're just saying these are the rules in Korea and the traditional whatever incumbent Korean financial system isn't going to be okay with people setting up an independent thing. Look, if you have a bank, a bank account at a large bank in your own name, and it turns out you're transacting for your business and doing dodgy foreign exchange stuff, that bank wants nothing to do with you, right? So this is not going to end particularly well. I think it's pretty clear how that's going to go. They've set up a licensing regime. A whole bunch of people have been shut down. A lot of stuff will just disappear. And then they're going to rebuild probably somewhat within the traditional bank whatever thing, a regime that does more reporting, asks more questions, and allows people to skirt stuff in more traditionally acceptable ways. I'm going to end it, clearly, but um, it's interesting to watch there because the, the political consensus is so clear because of the way the reporting is coming out. Um, um, I did see that um, some of the... Um, it's on Hang, Hang Kyung... The, I, yeah, I think that's their um, uh, that's like conservative business conservative yeah. business stuff. And some of the stuff that was in the reporting talked a little bit about um, knowing the sort of ultimate. Well, they didn't use the, the the exact term ultimate beneficial owner, but like sort of who ultimately holds or who owns or who benefits from the use of these stable coins and stuff like that. Uh, part of that has to do with what just uh, what John just said, which is basically <laughs> individuals are trading their own account for these corporate uh, transactions, which is obviously not cool. But it also raises an interesting question, uh, which we covered in the you right piece, um, which is that. If you're uh, because uh, under my car, which is the uh, markets and crypto assets law in in the EU, the way it works is that uh, a, a bank, financial institution, whoever it is, uh, can issue a stable coin, a euro backed stable coin. Most of the regulation has to do with the backing to make sure that the backing is adequate. You can you know have uh, have a perfect right redemption. Most of the because of the sort of baggage that we're st still carrying from the Terra Luna shit. Um, this is why I, I, I understandably a lot of this regulation tends to focus primarily on. Are the dollars well, still the, there? The EU, Europe in general, is big on prudential regulation. Yeah. So that's a... Korea will just mandate that it be in short-dated government bonds and cash, and that'll be yeah. the end of the conversation. Correct. There'll be no flexibility. There, right. Yeah. So so understandably, a lot of the re regulation and legislation has been in this specific department. One of the parts where, where I've... Um, and, and that's in the report. Uh, I, I expressed my opinion there as well, where I found that it seems a little bit lacking is that um, what happens is that if you... Um, as the issuer of the stable coin and you whitelisted somebody so to speak or if you onboarded somebody you perform KYC on, on on this entity to buy your stable coins from you they don't necessarily care what happens thereafter and, and to be fair there's nothing in MICA that requires them to then know who the ultimate users of these uh, stable coins are but to me that's kind of a gaping loophole because essentially then then whoever manages to onboard with a stable coin issuer s similar to Tether and how Tether operates his business, um, then what happens downstream? Nobody cares, and nobody's watching. And you, the the guy who's get who gets onboarded, essentially kind of acts like I'm not saying that they're money mules, but they kind of act like money Wait, mules. They, they act, stylistically, they're stylistically, behaving like a money they're, yeah, 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 yeah. So stylistically, they're they're behaving like a, uh, and that to me seems like a, a, a kind of a glaring gap in this in this thing. But at the same time, if you think about it this way, you know, a bank when you go to a bank, you you withdraw dollars and stuff like that. N there isn't that kind of responsibility to to sort of like find out who each and every single. Uh, piece of fiat currency goes to, but but I want to. <laughs> oh, sorry, but I would note that in a country that has strict 
exchange control yeah. regulations, it is very reasonable to expect yes. they will require transfers over X UBO changes to be reported. Correct, correct. Every, yeah. Whereas in the EU, that, that may not, may be, not be the case. case. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I would also say that we shouldn't be too quick to draw a false equivalency of um, a national currency issued by a national a country central bank or a treasury department um, or reserve or whatever the case may be um, and something that's essentially privately issued because uh, countries have currencies for for obvious reasons, for economic benefit to the country at large. Um, and this is why we always had that tussle between like, you know, central bank issued digital to- uh, uh, stable coins. And now we have this whole slew of privately issued stable coins. And it, it's, it's, it's strange because like, I'm, I'm not saying that th- there's an easy or clear answer to any of this, but to me that it, it's, it's strange because well, I mean, like, the government's not okay with liabilities being held by unKYC and UBOs under any circumstance exactly that's clearly one of the yeah. big blockers on that yeah forward. which yeah. which is why why they but then now are, are we saying that it's okay if the if a private issuer doesn't well in some contexts I mean we'll we'll, I, I, we'll see right? we'll see I, we'll I think, see but I think I, it's going to be interesting for Korea because they are the type of place where it's yeah. very reasonable to say you must know the transferee transfer yeah. in every case because on, on the flip side I can see why it wouldn't be practical like it, it's I mean then there's, you lose sort of the the whole reason for having a, uh, a stable coin anyway because the whole point is to have you know frictionless and quick and uh fast transfers of money and stuff like that i'm not saying that there's i mean it's just something to think about you know food for thought so um switching up gears let's go to the crypto.com lawsuit a lot of people have said that this kind of looks like the uh consensus v sec lawsuit in texas which, which is, it looks kind of like it well i mean <laughs> it's generically <in> <laughs> stylistically it looks about the same yeah. people have said they're not why are they bringing this in in texas as well the, you know consensus lost why would you do this as well well because this didn't lose consensus just said hey this is not the right uh, the court said the, yeah, hey, it's uh, the equivalent in your report card of getting a not applicable the, yeah the court said go go away, go away we're yeah. not talking about this yet because you already have an existing suit in yeah. in in uh, new york so yeah. what do you think you're doing here yeah. so um but there is one um well they wanted to declare Declaratory judgment before any final yeah. action had been taken. So here, some of it's devoted to explaining how the Wells notice damages them by itself. But anyway, yeah. but Sorry. you notice something that's materially yeah, different yeah. in this situation. Yes, indeed. Okay. So I will say they the, again. There was a Wells notice issued to Crypto.com. We don't have the exact details. Uh, they responded, and there's a list of tokens. The list of tokens does not include the Crypto.com chain token. It's now called Chronos, I think, which is interesting. So. They list a bunch of tokens that the SEC says are crypto asset securities, securities, how we test investment contract, usual, usual story. Um, I will also note parenthetically that crypto.com's characterization of Dash as having similar functionality to Bitcoin is just totally false because Dash has an on-chain voting DAO mechanism and some sort of native staking type stuff that Bitcoin doesn't support at all. And for a reason, right, for this reason. But anyway, um, yeah, but it does include the crypto.com token. So if you were going after a, a number of parties... Right, and the, the consensus filing, consensus is affiliated with a number of blockchains. Yeah. Like this is Linnea, whatever. But that this is not the consensus chain. It's a portfolio company. It's a sister company. It's a whatever. The Crypto.com chain is the Crypto.com chain. Yes. It's called that, I think, at one point. <laughs> a Kronos chain, a directly affiliated. And that one's not on the list. I, I don't understand if the government is unaware of that token. Um, we're not suggesting it is a security or whatever, but they're claiming the BN, BNBs on the list. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. Why would you put I'm the confused. Binance one? And the claim there is clearly related to it yeah, being yeah, yeah. affiliated with Binance yeah, yeah, yeah. And, or third party organization. So that that's a little bit. I don't know if that's a shortcoming. It's also possible that that's in the Wells notice and they didn't put it in the filing. But I, I mean, I it, it's possible. They mentioned in a meeting we, we are invited to. Remember, we're drawing this conclusion based on what can uh, what uh, Crypto.com has responded. So it, it's possible it's in the Wells notice and. But, I will say, if it's in the complaint, when the SEC comes back, they will say, by the way, you ignored the token issued by yourselves in your own chain, and the judge is going to, what, what are you people doing here? Right? This is not, it's, it's, it's that, it's if that's unlikely. happening, there's a very amusing short filing coming up saying, you know, maybe the issue they want litigated is not, and the judge is just going to dismiss that one before even deferring to the previous case. Um, I found that interesting. I don't know. Um uh, I, in, they've been harping on the same list of tokens, and I kind of wonder if their list of tokens comes from a fixed block of research done a while ago. It's a government agency with turnover. Those people may not work there anymore. I have no idea, right? Um, and they haven't, maybe they weren't aware of that chain at the time. I will say it was not a very popular chain. There wasn't a lot of action on that chain, but nonetheless, it's a token, right? It yeah, exists. Yeah, yeah. Also, Algorand's not exactly breaking any records for overall volume. 
no offense to Algorand, but you're not the biggest chain, right? It is what it is. Um, <laughs> nah, like, you know, yeah, 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 value judgment, it it's a yeah. statement of number. Rel- well, I guess it's a relative value judgment of the size of the numbers. Um, yeah, so I, I don't know. Maybe that list is just old. Uh, maybe they haven't updated it. Maybe they should update it. But certainly, if there's an affiliated business with a chain, I'm surprised. If the SEC doesn't believe the Crypto.com token is a security, I don't see how they could possibly prevail on Crypto.com secondary market transactions a BNB as being security. Like, whatever you think the line lies, right, Crypto.com's trading of the Crypto.com chain tokens has got to be closer to security than it's trading of anything else. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Those it's, may be both way over the line on either yeah. side, whatever, but one of them is closer to the other. It is no, strange. More of a problem. It is so strange. I, I'm, I was surprised by that. So, uh, 21 BTC, okay. okay, so context first, what is 21 BTC? Okay, so this is a, a provider of whatever, some exchange-traded products and a number of, I think they have an affiliated business that's a traditional asset manager, uh, asset, whatever, ETF, ETP-style provider. They have a wrapped Bitcoin product. They announced a program, a joint liquidity, whatever thing, with, in fact, coincidentally, Crypto.com, no real relation to the previous conversation. Um but it's not a very large product, right? The Ethereum version of it has just under 100 Bitcoin in it. And I forget what other chain they're on. And they have like 20 Bitcoin. So it's not big. The announcement was a little bit surprising. So what we're going to look at here is the use of this thing. It's a vanishingly small amount of use. And no one's holding it up as a lot of use. And what we're going to debate here, I think, or, or work through the mechanics of is, is this, you know, this thing may or may not be a security. We don't really know. And what's happening here may or may not constitute market manipulation. We don't really know. But it's interesting to look at. Okay, so this is the Ethereum uh, chain of this product. It's a wrapped Bitcoin product. And this is amount of minting and burning by date. So as you can see, the uh, amount burned. Let me get on the right thing here. So there's tiny amounts of burning, right, on a couple of dates. There's not really much burning going on. And the minting consists primarily of a huge amount here, well, huge relatively, 80 Bitcoin, 85 Bitcoin, and then an amount here, right? So this is not some large, heavily used, organic, whatever product. It's not a huge amount of action. We can go through where the minting went and where the flows go, but so this is just largest users of the token. And you can see here there's something related to Uniswap and a Uniswap pool versus WBTC note, and then just shrapnel amounts, shrapnel amounts. If I remember correctly, some of these are actually front-running bots that were sandwich attacking the Uniswap trades, whatever. You can see that there's really no broad use here. And we're not trying to criticize anybody for the lack of broad use. We're going to talk about, when we look at the trades that happened, what market manipulation really means. So let's just skip ahead. This is trading uh, through the Uniswap pool. So we've got, it's a strange way of looking at trading. I'll explain what the, what the axes are here. Because there's so little trading going on in the Uniswap pool. So this thing has a lot of liquidity, something like 80 Bitcoin of liquidity. And what you see here, the, um, let's remove the numbers of transfers first. Okay, so, okay, so these are amounts. So this is in and out for each transaction. Remember, every trade has two sides. So this is just the net transfer amount of each token. So 21 BTC wrapped Bitcoin versus WBTC. The fact that the two amounts are almost the same tells you the trade, the amount in and the amount out, the trade price was almost 1.0, right? Here, the amounts are almost exactly the same, 1.4, 1.4. So the price doesn't matter who was buying, who was selling, doesn't matter. 1.4 Bitcoin were traded through the Uniswap pool in total on this date at a price close enough to 1. 0.08 Bitcoin were traded on this date, 0.3. Fine, there's no action here. The price doesn't change. Now we add numbers of transactions. Look at that one, and let's just remove some transfer amounts. So there was, uh, there was one trade on this day, two trades, three trades, six trades, fifth. There's no organic activity here. Right? There's no organic activity. And we go back, and we look at the Uniswap pool, which is the Uniswap pool address. I think it's, this is the Uniswap pool address. You can see that the number of people involved in meaningful trading, again, there's some Arbot type action here, is, you know, what is it? One guy. There's one guy doing this trading, then there's this address here. So there are two people trading back and forth at the same price, what I'll call sporadically. The price isn't moving. There isn't a meaningful amount of the token, right? Not a lot is minted or burned. Okay. This is September. This is August. This is September. Um, oh, this is actually 
brand new. This just happened yesterday. Okay, when I looked at this data to prepare, I wasn't aware there was a tiny burn, but whatever. Uh, and the press release was issued somewhere in here about the partnership and talk about the activity here. So how do you want to do this? I'll give you a brief description of my read, then you can we go back and forth. So what's happening here is clearly not organic open market activity, right? There's no question this is not economically meaningful, but... There's basically no users. There's basically no volume. The price isn't moving other than accidentally tripping up irrelevant amounts of some R bots doing, you know, 0.01, just meaningless amounts of transfers, right? No harm. <laughs> you didn't hurt anybody. And while they did issue a press release during this period, actually, it's after this big thing here, that press release wasn't <coughs> touting the amount of utility. It was about developing a partnership for future liquidity, whatever. To me, it seems like you didn't, you know, maybe you did some testing in production. Testing in production is not ideal. That doesn't have a great reputation. But this doesn't seem like the worst market manipulation to me. They didn't move any price. I, but I will concede that you could argue, formally speaking, it might be. So, so wait, let, let's, um, I think we missed one step here, though, that these transactions basically were um, transactions between themselves. Oh, yeah. So it's all one guy, and it's the guy who did the minting. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So so we missed that, that little bit. So that that's why this looks the way it does. It's basically like sending the stuff to yourself, which is absolutely fine if it's meant to be like a test trade. Now, where I think um, becomes less clear is if this were a stock exchange and you were basically buying and selling back to yourself, that's against the, the the rules that's against the law like you're buying and selling back to yourself like you're, you're windmilling meaningless trades even if you don't move price yeah so i think we can all agree <coughs> that if you did this on registered securities and registered securities exchange that it would count as market manipulation but also you would know those prices were broadcast on the big board to people yeah and you get more than random r bots caught up but yeah okay yeah so there are a couple of things to unpack first of all you have to say that first of all you have to kind of uh, establish uh, that rap btc is a Security. What could be commodity manipulation? Let, let's punt yeah. on that question. First. Yeah, so it could be security, could be commodities, either way. Now, the bigger question is, is it manipulation? So some would argue that, um, look, the price didn't move, um, you know, so it's not, therefore it's not manipulation. However, by creating the impression that there is um, a trading activity, uh, that, some, that what, what could appear to be organic trading activity when none existed, is a form of market manipulation. Okay, so that's where that's where. So for me, had they issued a press release touting the utility and the high volume and pointed, I mean, this volume's not very high, but whatever, pointed the volume, hundred percent with you. That's not cool because if you traded with yourself and tout how that means there's volume, that's. But they didn't do that. No, no, they just I did this with themselves. I get this, but any the, the point of the market right is to have um, discovery of information, okay. and the minute that you have any kind of transaction that. Um, uh, sort of uh, distorts the purity and clarity of that information, that is a form of market manipulation on a strict sense. It don't matter if it's a cent okay. I, I or a hundred bucks. I, okay, I, in a colloquial sense, I'm with you. Yeah. To me, it still feels like, I guess we talked about this a little bit before, we both agree that had they issued the equivalent of an 8K, they issued a public statement saying, we're going to do the following six transactions in production to test the system, then they're totally clear. Yeah. And it feels weird to me that issuing a meaningless press release that no one will read because no one transacts it absolves you of having done something wrong. It feels like you just didn't do anything wrong in the first place. But maybe that's just... I, I... So the reason that the, the reason we're in this situation to begin with is because if you needed to test this thing, you have the only way to test it is in production. I mean, agreed. So yeah, that's what's so fascinating here. That we, it feels like this is occurring right on the line. We're right here. We're very close to the line of what is and isn't manipulation, whether it's commodity security, it may matter, market manipulation. And it's touching an issue that isn't talked about very much. That manipulation appears to be occurring for something adjacent to a weird, obscure technical problem that doesn't exist in traditional finance because you just launch a test version of the database, do whatever you want, yeah. who cares? You, you, Whereas here, no one seems to rely on that. You, you couldn't really um, test this any other way, so to speak. I mean, you know, yeah, yeah, this yeah. would be the only way you could do yeah, it. Yeah. Now, I mean, you can do some I mean, testing, but it's not. You don't. You have know, the same usually, if you're going to do the test, 
people would come out and go like, this is a test, this is to please ignore these transactions and stuff like that. But as a result, I, you know, it's a bit like when you, uh, your observation of the test and your creation of the test distorts and the market right off the bat. I also think people might be resistant to putting out the press release because the press release is admitting it's you doing it. Whereas here we're inferring it from on-chain data. That's saying straight up, I'm the one booking these trades with myself. And I can totally understand, I can understand why, why people yeah, don't yeah, want to yeah, issue that yeah, press yeah, release. Yeah, yeah. No. It's, now, th this one really is interesting. It sits right there in, in, on the border of a number of these problems. Huh? So what, what are the outcomes? One of the things that could happen is, A... Um, well, I mean, it's an irrelevantly small product. Yeah, and yeah. There will be no outcome. Correct. Like, we can so, agree on that. But, <laughs> but if this was a, an issue... You'd be like, maybe let off with a warning or something like that. Don't do, don't do this again. Small fine. It feels like it, you'd be getting a slap on the wrist. Yeah, a fine. kind of slap on the wrist, like, like, you know, don't do this kind of stuff. But then, then begs the question: how, how do you test? But that's that's a different problem for a different. We issue the press release. I mean, yeah. I don't think anybody. I, neither. While I think we have slightly different opinions on what's going on here, I wouldn't have a serious problem with them having. It, it, this is all conceptual because nobody's gonna. This a tiny thing. I don't think anybody's getting gonna a about small this. fine, cease and desist, and then issue an 8K every time they want to do this in the future, and then people just do that. That'd be some nice clarity, actually. Doing nothing maybe is okay. It's a fascinating case. People should, you know, try to take a little bit of a look at this one because it's it's a good. It's real. This is not contrived. This looks like a contrived thing we've made up to debate. But this data is real. No, it's no, just, it's, it's, it's just it's real. paltry data, right? Which is, you know, you don't really get that in equities. <laughs> and on that note, thanks for tuning in. Uh, thank you for all your likes, comments, and subscribes. We appreciate it. Um, as always, uh, if you've got more feedback, more things that you want us to talk about, more things you want us to cover, just uh, hit us up in the comment section below. Otherwise, have a great weekend, and we will see you again next week. Thank you. Bye-bye.